Yep. Please start. I'm looking forward to your talk. My name is Chris Hume. Um, as Joachim hinted at, my name used to be Hume Smith until quite recently, and before that it was just Smith. Um, I won't go into all the gory details about why my name has kept changing, but uh, for now and probably forevermore, I'm, I'm Chris Hume. Um, I worked in phase transformations and complex properties research group uh, when I started my PhD in October 2011, almost exactly the same time as Ed started. And I left after completing a postdoc in 2017. And shortly afterwards, I started my work here as an assistant professor of powder metallurgy here at uh, the Department of Material Science and Engineering in the Royal Institute of Technology here in Stockholm. But today's not really about me, it's about Harry. So I just wanted to explain how my journey with Harry has gone. Um, I think I first met Harry in any meaningful sense in the part two, so that's the third year class, um, as an undergraduate on crystallography. I think it was C6, if my memory serves. I couldn't find the scans of my notes, but maybe Harry can correct me if I get the names wrong. Um, the one thing I'm pretty sure of is that then we went on and did steels, which at the time, and hopefully probably still now, is called M21. Um, and that was really where I realized just how good of a teacher Harry is, um, and that I wanted to work with steels um, in my future career. At the time, I was a bit uncertain whether I wanted to go and work in device materials and do solar cells, or whether I wanted to go and work with metals. And it was really that course, um, Steels, that made me work with metals and got me to where I am today. So for that, I will be forever grateful to Harry. And uh, I'm very pleased that I can express that gratitude in this forum here today. As I said, I then went on to do a PhD in Phase Transformations Group. Uh, my PhD was part of the Rolls-Royce University Technology Center. and uh, my eventual title, it went through several iterations, but was uh, the thermal stability of bulk nanocrystalline steels. And I'm going to sort of summarize it briefly today in this talk um, before I talk a bit more about Harry at the end and my um, enduring memories of Harry, which is, you know, something I'm very keen to do today. Um, and as I said, that was part of the Rolls-Royce University Technology Center. Overlapping the end of my doctoral project was my postdoctoral project. Um, sounds a bit odd, was a very, very large project, um, of which we were a relatively small part, but still a, a full-time full postdoc, which was essentially about making components from metal powders. And this is how I got into powder metallurgy. So again, very grateful to Harry for setting me on the path that's taken me where I am today. Uh, it was basically designing a steel, and uh, it was quite a wide brief initially, um, that could withstand high temperatures and therefore had creep resistance, but was also resistant to fatigue. And um, the sort of abstract of the project was that this would be based on nanostructured bainite or super bainite as we can call it. And Rolls-Royce wanted to use this in the jet engines. I'm not gonna go into details because I remember there was some confidentiality issues surrounding my thesis when I wrote it. And I had to remove a lot of the background um, as to why it was being used. So I'm not going to talk about that today, but just obviously it was with Rolls-Royce in their sort of jet engine side of the company. So you can probably guess it was going to be used in jet engines. And the public information says that it should resist fatigue and creep. And another goal was to minimize manufacturing costs compared to the process that Rolls-Royce were using at the time, probably still used today, actually. And what did we do? Well, of course, we did a lot of alloy, well, I did a lot of alloy design, very standard phase transformations kind of project. Alloy design using all of the tools uh, that had been developed over the years under Harry's leadership and all of the equipment that was built up um, in Cambridge. I got very familiar with the Thermec um, back when it was uh, just about still working. And we managed to coax it along for another couple of years. A lot of X-ray diffractometry and microscopy, of course. Um, there you go, there's the dilatometry and the thermic. I never quite got the chance to use the new dilatometer that we bought. Uh, I was a bit too late for that when I needed it, but uh, you know, I was there when it was bought. And uh, the thing that I'm most happy about was having the chance to do synchrotron and neutron diffraction. So synchrotron X-ray diffraction and neutron diffraction to characterize real time phase changes in the steel. And I'll, I'll build to that towards the end of the, the slides. But what was the main challenge? Well, of course, those of you that have worked with super bainite or read about it know that traditionally, 
it has a relatively high carbon content. I think when I started, the kind of base cases that I was given to do to work on as a starting point were about 1%, a little bit higher in carbon content. And of course, repeatedly heating it to the target temperature, which at the start of my PhD was 400 degrees. By the end of my PhD, the target temperature for the service uh, was 450 degrees, and I was told probably it would be 500 degrees soon anyway, so you might as well just assume 500 degrees, is that you precipitate out cementite because of the high carbon content. That then means that the remaining austenite, the retained austenite, especially in the blocks, is very unstable, and when you cool it back down again to room temperature, you get a very rapid transformation or a very extensive transformation to martensite, which makes everything brittle and weak. And that was something which had been established by Thomas Sermi and amongst others before I started my project. So I sat down and I thought to myself, okay, how am I going to do this? I went through all the different literature that there was and um, came up with all the different tools that were on the PT group website. And I made extensive use of NUCG. And I saw there was a talk on that last week. I haven't been able to watch that yet because I was teaching at the time. Uh, but I look forward to, to looking more about that uh, later on the video, on the YouTube video. Uh, I think that was NUCG 46. I used 83, but uh, still very similar, obviously, in, in concept. Uh, extensive use of empty data and started me on my career of thermodynamic modeling. And then from there, using MPTT data with one of Harry's fantastic names for a program uh, to predict things like bainite um, transformation times and so on for my process design and building on some of Harry's work using artificial neural networks together with uh, um, David Mackay's work on Bayesian um, back propagation algorithms and Bayesian statistics backing up the neural network to give uncertainties, which is something I'm very keen to push people to do today. And I also made use of genetic algorithms, although not relatively successfully, but didn't end up working too well in the end. <clears throat> okay, so we went, I went through lots of iterations of um, the different alloy designs. I think in total I designed 13 different alloys, and I remember Kevin down in the process lab before he retired, making them all for me on the arc melter, making the little fingers uh, 50 gram samples that we probably all remember, a lot of us remember so well, testing them and finding out that they didn't work. Um, but in the end, I came up with two designs, uh, one that was a sort of iteration on something um, that was already around, which was basically a very high silicon variant of the alloy. And another, um, which was something I came up with myself, which was to reduce the carbon content and increase other austenite stabilizers. Uh, with the idea being that we could minimize the precipitation of carbides and maximize the stability of any remaining austenite through other alloying additions like nickel and cobalt. So I pushed it as high as I dared with nickel and cobalt um, using uh, aluminium instead of silicon to help drive the bainite transformation and suppress cementite at the same time. Um, and uh, hoping um, that one of those two would work. And at the time, it was all kind of fairly positive indications, but still a lot of uncertainty about whether or not any of this would work, which is how research probably should be. I think if you're very certain of your results before you start, you probably haven't tried something sort of exciting or new enough. Um, so I felt like I was right on the edge, and I was very fortunate that Harry was there to keep pushing me, because I think there were many times I probably would have pulled back and done something a bit more conservative without being pushed like that. Okay, so... How did these look? Well, um, maybe, I hope it comes across okay on the slide. If it doesn't, go away and read my thesis because there's lots of micrographs in there. I'm not gonna go through all the micrographs today because I don't have time and it's probably really boring for people. But needless to say, we were able, or I was able to form um, nanostructured bainite um, as we kind of moved away from the super bainite name slightly to help, you know, help promote it within Rolls-Royce. So we got this nanostructure bainite in um, alloy eight, which was the high silicon with modest nickel content. And, um, but if we pushed it too low and transformed at 200 degrees, I found that you got bainite and some lovely martensite there. Uh, very lovely microstructure that I saw on our, uh, in the optical microscope. And this is actually very much in line with the predictions from MUCG. Uh, because if I analyze the driving forces from empty data, it was indicating that I should form bainite at these temperatures, but MECG was telling me no. Um, bainite will start to form at 410 degrees 
And um, I think it was what, 240 degrees, I've got in my notes here, 240 degrees would where you'd start to form Martin flight. And sure enough, uh, 250 degrees formed 100% bainite or extensively bainite. 200 degrees, we ended up with it, or I ended up with a lot of Martin site, which was kind of saying how reliable and good MECG prediction was for this alloy, even though it was slightly outside the range at which MECG was um, sort of intended to work. It's actually a testament to how reliable the tool is in the right conditions. If we look at the more extreme uh, high nickel, high cobalt variant that I, I generated, um, We've got extensive banding, and I remember in the, being in the lab with Steve uh, looking at this one day, just with the naked eye, you could see the banding after you etched it in nitrile. It was beautiful. Um, doesn't come across so well on the micrographs, but I hope you can see this kind of alternating bright and dark bands running vertically here and a, a bright band coming across. Actually, within those bands, they look pretty similar, um, but they are very pretty when you see them with the naked eye and at low magnification. <clears throat> but in both cases, we still form, or I still form bainite. Another thing which I was very, very um, happy with was alloy A behaved extremely well uh, for a steel alloy. Just generally transforming it at different isothermal transformation temperatures gave us just very, very different um, hardnesses and very different phases. So at 800 degrees, we formed extensive graphite nodules, followed by ferrite, um, large grains of ferrite and martensite in between, a bit cooler, um, where you go from having a sort of three-phase mixture according to the thermodynamics to a two-phase mixture of ferrite and graphite. That's exactly what we formed. At lower temperatures, we formed perlite. Below that, ferrite with islands of different carbides, including cementite. And then below 450 degrees um, here, we formed carbide-free bainite. And of course, at this point, it wasn't necessarily nanostructured. Um, but as we go to spots lower temperatures, it did become nanostructured. So exactly very well behaved. And then below this 240 degree limit, the transformation product, so I think this was at 225 uh, Celsius, was martensite everywhere. And it follows a very nice pattern and it was very beautiful, sort of a textbook uh, transformation. And I then produced this very nice um, three-dimensional x-ray plot. It was one of the highlights of my thesis actually was this, this plot. Where, we show, where I showed that at high temperatures, basically we just have ferrite um, and a small amount of, uh, well, ferrite and martensite, which you can't distinguish using this technique. And as we cool down, we begin to get austenite peaks appearing uh, because that's what you expect according to the thermodynamics and it works. Down to all of these closely spaced lines, which is the bainite transformation experiments where we form lovely austenite peaks as well. And then going down to the Martin site, these gray lines at 225 degrees, where there is very little austenite and is almost none shown in the XRD. And if we zoom in a bit closer, we can see how as we cool the transformation temperature, we begin to retain more austenite um, following the completion of the transformation. Exactly as one would expect for bainite. But that was just an interesting aside. The whole point was to make something which would form this nanostructured bainite, super bainite, and be thermally stable. And this is what we use the synchrotron experiments for. So we know that, oh, it was known before I started that if you just have nanocrystalline bainite or super bainite and you temper it, what happens is that initially you just get thermal expansion until eventually you precipitate carbides from the austenite, at which point the austenite lattice parameter and the dimensions of the sample contract due to the loss of carbon from the matrix. And this has been published again by Thomas Sommer with dilatometry. And uh, you can see it very clearly in some of the X-ray synchrotron images, or X-ray synchrotron results that I'll show you soon. Upon cooling, the metastable austenite transforms to martensite. And of course, that makes the whole structure weak, uh, well, brittle, and therefore weak under tension. And that then gave me the two ideas based on that literature uh, knowledge. Could we suppress carbide precipitation in completely? And that's what led to the principle of this alloy age with the high silicon and aluminium contents, which were as high as I dared make them without forming lots of dross. Or could we stabilize the austenite without carbon? And that's where the alloy nine concept comes in, with lots of nickel and cobalt. Okay, so if we look at how they performed, 
Well, this is Alloy 8, and we did this uh, at DACI, um, one of the experiments we took at, uh, samples to DACI for. And as you can see, um, hopefully you can see that the, the peaks associated with all of the phases, austenite and ferrite, they begin to get lower in angle as the experimental time goes on. And so what this experiment was, was that this was um, bainite that had been formed at 250 degrees till the transformation had run to completion. It was then heated at 10 degrees per minute to 500 degrees and held there until things stopped changing, at which point we then cooled it freely to room temperature. So what we can see is that at short times, when the sample is just heating for room temperature, everything gets lower diffraction angle, lower Bragg angle, which means the lattice is expanding its thermal expansion as we'd expect. Then very abruptly, the austenite shifts. It kind of turns a corner. You can see that, especially on the 220 peak here, sort of turns a corner and goes to higher diffraction angles as the lattice is contracting again because of the loss of carbon. And shortly after that, the austenite disappears. So this is thermal decomposition of the austenite exactly as it's being reported in literature. So basically, alloy eight didn't work for what we wanted it to do. And you can see that very clearly if you do the reed valve refinement and look at the austenite volume fraction. Um, over time, it stays in the early stage is quite stable at sort of 28 percent plus or minus 2% or thereabouts. And then the lattice parameter increases pretty linearly um, until it reaches a maximum. And after the lattice parameter begins to reduce, the austenite basically disappears almost entirely from the system, leaving a very small amount of residual austenite afterwards. If we look at alloy 9, on the other hand, this was done at Diamond, and we had a bit less time, so we had to um, heat and cool at uh, faster rates here, but apart from that, the experiment is very similar. Um, the, we trans I transformed this at 250 degrees again, so it's directly comparable to the previous case. Um, we heated it up to 600 degrees, basically to try and accelerate any decomposition um, that we could get, uh, just because we were short on time and how many experiments we could fit into the beam time. And what we can see here is that the austenite actually persists all the way through heating, through holding for about two hours uh, after it's been heated. So, you know, six, seven thousand seconds, that's, uh, you know, getting on for two hours and then quenching back down to room temperature at 20 degrees per minute. Um, still, the austenite survives. A lot of it does. And if again, if we look at the lattice parameter and the volume fraction, what we find is that the volume fraction of austenite does decrease, but it stabilizes again at temperature at 600 degrees. And of course, if you did this at 500 degrees, probably it would stabilize at a slightly lower level. Uh, so it's dropped from um, sort of, um, yeah, what's this, 29 plus or minus 1%. And it kind of falls to sort of 20%, roughly 19%. And it stays there. And the lattice parameter initially undergoes thermal expansion, undergoes a slight contraction as it loses all its carbon, and there or loses a lot of carbon, and then contracts under cooling. But look at the austenite under cooling is still stable. It doesn't go anywhere. So that's kind of very positive step forward. That now we can survive quite an aggressive tempering treatment, uh, certainly more uh, heat than Rolls-Royce would normally expect to see in that particular component. <clears throat> we also had some uh, requirements of the strength and fatigue resistance and the toughness. And if you look at the strength of these alloys, we just take the UTS uh, just to give you a quick um, marker here because we're quite short on time. Um, alloy 8, um, even at temperature, was still over one gigapascal UTS, which was way above what they wanted, or way above what they needed. Um, and alloy 9, uh, over almost 900, 850, 900, again, above what was required, which was very good for the project. And if we look at the toughness, um, actually alloy 9 was so tough it could hardly be measured. Um, for, we couldn't get a K1C reading for most of these because the toughness was just too high. So there wasn't a valid K1C test. Uh, we could get a sort of a measure, they call that KQ, and this still very high, uh, much higher than was what uh, Rolls-Royce wanted. Finally, for me, I'd just like to say thank you very much for everything scientific and non-scientific. And if anyone deserves a very happy retirement, so yeah, thanks again for, for the great talk, really in interesting results. Um, I was wondering if anyone had any questions, I haven't. But you didn't uh, actually mention anything about um, the really nice work that you did on the tetragonality. One of the big things that came out of my research was a bit of a, 
a bit of an aside from the industrial application was that the, we found during some very careful analysis of the synchrotron and neutron data that actually the, it seemed as though the bainitic ferrite was not cubic, it was tetragonal. And this was something that um, is very easily explained. And uh, uh, someone's asking what the level of tetragonality is in the bainite in comparison with the martensite. Um, it's actually consistent with the published relationship. Um, so it's the same, basically. Um, what is it? Uh, C over O ratio is one plus 0 0.0045 times the weight percent of carbon. 